Hi, so now we're going to talk about phylogenetic trees and how we reconstruct the history of life, which is actually a very, very difficult task because think about it, life originated on Earth about 3.5 billion years ago. And today we believe we have about 10 million organisms. And then trying to build that evolutionary history of how all these organisms are related um, is an extremely difficult task. So the very first thing we want to do here, we want to understand how to read those phylogenetic trees. So we have a node that's going to indicate the common ancestor. We have a branch. These are going to be your organisms that we are comparing. And then there is a root. So basically this ancestral lineage that we have. So a node, let's add some nodes right here. So this would be a node. This is a common ancestor. Here's common ancestor right here of a taxon B and C. And these are the branches, the tips um, in a tree that shows organisms and how closely related they are. So what you want to keep in mind is that when we read the phylogenetic trees, make sure you understand that this. If you actually compare an organism for example here we have gorilla and then we have a human and we have the uh, we have a chimpanzee so we would say that human is not necessarily more closely related to gorilla than the chimp because human is sitting closer to gorilla here so that would be incorrect way to interpret this remember what can happen here is this you can rotate that branch around and still get the same exact meaning. So imagine if we actually cut right here at the base and we turn around the entire those two branches for the chimp and human, we're going to get human right here and we're going to get the chimp right here. So it means it gives you exactly the same meaning. So it means the human and the chimp is equally related to gorilla, equally. So just because um, one organism is, is visually sitting on the branch closer to another one, that doesn't mean they're going to be more closely related. So we want to look at the common ancestor. You can see the chimp and the human is, is sharing a common ancestor right here. And then back in the evolutionary history, there's another common ancestor that includes gorilla lineage. Keep that in mind. Here's another example. We have um, a small cladogram here, and we have species A, B, C, D, E, and you can see D and E share a common ancestor right here, and then C, D, E share a common ancestor right here, and then here's another one, here's another one as we progress back in time. So now we would say, okay, is species C more, more closely related to D? or would it be to B? What do you think? So the way we interpret this would be C is more closely related to D. Why? Because you can see this entire grouping right here includes the common ancestor here. So C shares a common ancestor with D. Do you see it? And then there's a more distant common ancestor for the B. So this is why we would say C and D would be more related than C and B. All right, here's another example. If you look at these trees, would you be able to tell if these trees are different? So what you have to do is, again, look at the common ancestor between the organisms. So we have A and B sharing common ancestor right here, and then... A and B and C have a common ancestor right here. And as you can see, the D would be the out group. And the same thing we see here, that's your out group. And then A and B sharing common ancestor right here. And the C, so you can see these trees are actually exactly the same. So like I said before, what you want to do is visualize that you cut this rod here and sort of turn it around so you turn everything and you can see you actually get the same thing so when we build these phylogenetic trees the idea is to have a monophyletic grouping because all the other groupings do not 
accurately reflect evolutionary history. So we do not want this, we do not want that, um, because as you can see in paraphyletic grouping, we have um, common ancestor, and then we have some of the descendants here. So this one is excluded. And then in para, um, I'm sorry, polyphyletic grouping, we have various species from different ancestors. So here's an ancestor for E and F, and here is an ancestor for G. So this is also not an ideal clade. So the idea is try to build a clade that would be monophyletic. So it means we have a ancestor, common ancestor, and we include all of the descendants. Now, obviously, this is a very difficult task, but we can try. All right, so how do we build a phylogenetic tree? So in order to build a phylogenetic tree, we have we, ca we can use many different sources of data. Uh, we can look at morphology, meaning physical characteristics. We can use molecular data, DNA, RNA, even proteins. And we can even look at development or behavior of organisms. So um, useful for building trees would be homologous structures because homologous structures, the presence of homologous structures imply common ancestor. So here I have an example. This is a homology amniotic egg. And you can see all these species in a tree of life are sharing this characteristic. So it means they are uh, stemming from that common ancestor because they all have that homology. Um, another way that we can build the phylogenetic trees is by using shared derived characters. So this is when we have homologies that are present in some, but not all members of the group. So shared traits, by the way, are called synapomorphies. And then unique traits that apply to only specific organisms in a, in a tree of life or in that group will be autapomorphies. So we can see here um, a summarized character table and a group of organisms that have those characters or don't. So zeros represent the fact that they don't have the trait and uh, one represents the fact that it has a trait. So we can sort them and then build a phylogenetic tree based on these shared derived characters. And you can see uh, some of these characters are going to be shared by all of the organisms and then eventually something is going to be unique to one of them. Okay, one caution here when it comes to analogous structures. So because not all similar traits are evidence of relatedness. So obviously analogous structures are going to make comparisons very difficult because these structures can actually mislead us. So notice right here we have a, a wing of a bat and a wing of a bird. So now you would think, okay, these are wings, so it means these organisms are closely related. Not necessarily, because analogous structures can arise due to convergent evolution. And convergent evolution occurs when you have similar environmental pressures and natural selection produce similar analogous adaptations in organisms from different evolutionary lineages. So what this means, these traits evolve independently in separate lineages because there are these environmental pressures that are sort of that are favoring specific traits. So if they have these traits they're going to be surviving. So um, another thing that you want to keep in mind um, is evolutionary reversal. So this is when a character or a specific trait reverts back to the ancestral state. For example, penguin ancestors used to have wings to fly. Now penguins do have wings, but they lost the ability to fly. So this would be an example of evolutionary reversal. So what this means is organisms are distantly related, not closely related, not a recent common ancestor, rather than they, they are distantly related. So similar traits that are generated by convergent evolution and evolutionary reversals are called homoplastic traits. So here's a new term for you, homoplasies. 
So you can see homoplasies here. We're looking at the presence or absence of legs and also evolutionary reversal example. We see how the common ancestor for snakes and lizards had legs and then snakes no longer have legs. So this is actually reversal. So here's another example. Birds and bats, the trait is the fact that they have wings and they're able to fly, but these two have emerged because of convergent evolution. So they, uh, they wouldn't, birds and bats would not be sitting close to one another as far as uh, in a tree of life. So now a more reliable data to infer phylo phylogenies would be molecular data because we can compare DNA, RNA, we can compare proteins. So this is where we can be more objective and we compare the amount of mutations we have within the DNA and that's how we can derive the evolutionary relationship among the organisms. And we have this publicly available database here that's called BLAST, Basic Local Alignment Search Tool, where we actually enter the desired gene and we can run against the database and compare that gene to what is available and possibly find very, very close matches. So that way we can actually build those phylogenetic trees. So mutations can be used to estimate evolutionary time because mutations occur at a constant rate in related species. So it's um, we compare the rate of ticking to a molecular clock. So we can see we have an ancestral DNA here. As this time goes on, this DNA is going to accumulate mutations. So you can see the splitting of the lineages is happening here and there's one mutation right there in this lineage and another mutation right here and then 10 million 10 million years later we have another mutation that pops up here and then here you go another one so it means those lineages are accumulating mutations and they are diverging and they are becoming more separate and reproductively isolated. And this is how actually new species arise at, as a result. So two examples of molecular clock would be mitochondrial DNA that is used to study closely related species because mitochondrial DNA is passed on maternally, meaning from mom to all the offspring. Another one is ribosomal RNA that can be used to study distantly related species because ribosomal RNA has many conserved regions, so it means it does not mutate as often. Now, how do we actually build a phylogenetic tree?